Okay, last week we exposed Inslee's violent sexual predator neighborhood home release for profit scheme. And we focused on one of the first sites located in South Thurston County, near Tenino and just south of Tumwater. Now we've learned a lot since we published that video. Uh, the story, unfortunately, doesn't get any better the deeper we dig. Many of us still have a lot of questions that the state has not answered, but let's discuss what we have learned, what questions still need to be asked, and how we got here in the first place. And of course, where do we go from here? Now, before I dive into the update on the story, don't forget to share, like, and subscribe to this channel. It doesn't cost you anything, and it only takes a few seconds. And also, if you do have comments, please leave them below. I do read them all, and I try to respond to as many as I can. Now, again, just for quick review, Washington State currently houses the worst of the worst violent sexual predators, those who either were convicted of raping or sexually assaulting, usually many victims, mostly children and women, on the 4,400-acre McNeil Island in South Puget Sound, right here. This island's been used as a site of a state or federal prison since the late 1800s. Now, most of the 215 or so violent sexual predators are in a civil commitment status, which means that they were either deemed too mentally unfit to stand trial originally after they were caught harming their many victims, or they already finished their original criminal sentence and are deemed so certain to reoffend that they're held in a civil commitment status there. Now, under Governor Inslee's direction and with his great leadership and wisdom, presumably with Attorney General Bob Ferguson's blessing, the state decided that rather than keep these violent guys on an isolated island where there's no children or women to victimize, where they're in supervised living conditions, and they're unlikely to escape with a very chilly long-distance swim in Puget Sound, instead of keeping them there, these politicos decided to unleash these violent predators into our communities. Now, it's not just to another facility or an isolated location with similar supervision. Nope, that would actually make too much sense, and that would appear to be rational government policy. Nope, instead, our political leaders decided that it was best to just spread these guys around the state in small, private homes, next to daycare facilities, school bus stops, neighborhoods, and other locations, much more convenient and conducive for the violent sex offenders to live out their repressed escape fantasies. Now, of course, since I posted the first video on the subject, we have learned a lot more about this program, and we don't know everything yet. The state agencies are understandably reluctant to part with the information that we've requested from them, but we will eventually get to the bottom of this scheme. For now, however, here is what we do know. First, this sexually violent predator release scheme was essentially drafted in Washington State Senate Bill 5163, and it was signed into law by Governor Inslee in May of 2021. The title of this bill was watered down to say, Concerning the Placement and Treatment of Conditionally Released Sexually Violent Predators. And I've linked to the original bill down below, so you can actually go on the state legislator web, legislative website, and you can verify for yourself, you can read it yourself, and you can actually see who voted for it. Now, this bill was originally drafted and sponsored by four Democrat senators, strategically, or strategically, they were four women instead of men, of course, and they were all women. That was a kind of a plan. But they're originally Senator Monka Dingra from the 45th Legislative District right here in Northeast King County. She currently works in the King County Prosecutor's Office, ensuring that criminals get released back on the streets as early as possible. And she's currently making the news in Washington State for blocking a bipartisan law uh, enforcement reform bill that has to do with allowing police around the state to actually chase criminals again. Another prime sponsor was Senator Saldana from the 40, uh, 37th Ledge District up in Seattle, whose background is primarily as a labor activist with the union SEIU. The third prime sponsor was Senator Claire Wilson from the 30th Ledge District in Federal Way. Now, she comes out of the public school bureaucracy, and she has a stated goal of disrupting the institutions that keep criminals where they are, presumably meaning that she wants to dump criminals, particularly violent sexual predators like these McNeil Island guys, back into the community because that just makes sense to her. And of course, the final prime sponsor of this bill to make it kind of a full quartet was Senator Christine Rolfs from the 23rd Legislative District. She represents Bainbridge Island, which is the home of Governor Inslee. That's actually where he lives. So when you actually look back on the passage of this bill, it was mostly a partisan bill. Generally, the Democrats supported releasing the violent sex predators into homes throughout the state, and Republicans generally opposed it. And this was clear in the Senate, but on the House side, a handful of Republicans did vote for it for some reason. And then the four most vulnerable Democrats who were concerned about the re-election campaigns, they voted against it. 
Now, on one point worth remembering was that this bill was passed, along with a lot of other bad bills, right in the middle of the COVID panic and the drama with the lockdown Zoom legislative session. If you remember the Fence Capitol campus and the, the National Guard out there and the threats of arrest by the state for those of us who wanted to commit acts of free speech on the Capitol campus. In fact, uh, those of you who are regular viewers of this channel, you might remember my Come Commit an Act of Free Speech and Get Arrested with Me event at the Capitol that was held earlier that year, which forced the state to back down from that stupid and hostile policy. It was very hard for people to testify with the Zoom legislative session going on and this heavy hand of the Democrats conveniently silencing people uh, anytime they wanted to testify. They were also silencing Republicans, hitting that mute button. So regardless, most people in our state at that time were certainly not focused in the state legislature. They were dealing with losing businesses, getting fired because of vax mandates, and many other personal levels of chaos as everybody was kind of losing their collective minds. Now, the direct consequences of that piece of really insane legislation are being felt in the Tenino Tumwater community, as we discussed last week. And there was one part of that bill that I want to draw your attention to now, which I believe helped open the door to these kind of weird for-profit groups like Supreme Living and others to kind of hop on this violent sex predator contract gravy train. Now, I've linked to the original bill down below, as I said, but... If you go to page 19, lines 1 through 8, you're going to notice that the state legislature and Governor Inslee, again presumably with A.G. Ferguson's endorsement, decided to exempt the agents who are involved in housing and managing these violent sex predators from civil liability. So these lines, and again, I encourage you to read the full text of the bill below, but these lines refer to the Department of Corrections, but they're also included, they include what they call the agents of this policy, which presumably includes DSHS, which is the state government agency assigned to supervise this program, and all the private, for-profit, or non-profit entities which own the homes, are responsible for monitoring the violent sex predators, and who plan to make a lot of bank from the taxpayer cash that they will get paid to do this. It's a sweet deal because no matter how poorly they execute their tasks, they get the cash and they will use these eight lines in the bill to exempt themselves from civil liability and lawsuits from the future victims they plan to create with this program. Now, unfortunately, it does get worse. In addition to this first house in Thurston County, I have also been contacted by others around the state who are discovering similar homes being purchased and or renovated near them. There are some common themes that we are discovering with all these locations. So it isn't just Thurston County. Remember, the state has mandated that these violent sex offenders be released in a fair share method by sending them all over the state. Some of them will be located near where you live too. Maybe not near where Governor Inslee lives on Bainbridge Island or near where the state senators live, but certainly near where you and I live. Now, one common theme that we're finding is that when they purchase the home, these private groups are always lying to the neighbors. The sellers and usually the real estate agent, uh, uh, they always lie to them about what they actually plan to do with the home. In the Thurston County location, they claim that they were planning to use the house to help foster kids. I've seen a copy of the text messages from the previous owners of that house and the real estate agent informing her of this use. And this previous owner actually testified to this fact in last week's Thurston County Commissioner meeting. Now, in a Pierce County house, they told the neighbors that they were going to use that location to house a small retirement community. But, of course, they were not. <laughs> now, another common theme is these homes are typically staffed by underqualified people, often not informed properly about the job that they'll be expected to undertake. In the Thurston County House, the only qualifications are a GED or high school diploma, valid driver's license, and a willingness to work for about 18 bucks per hour. And they'll get three hours of training, and then they're expected to supervise five of the worst violent sex predators Washington State has ever caught. They're expected to supervise them after they've been locked up in either prison or civil confinement for many, many years. Now, in all these homes that we've discovered so far, the investors and the managers, just like Angela Ronaldo here, uh, who we featured in our last video, they're bragging about the financial windfall that they expect to collect. And the crazy money seems so good that they just don't care about the consequences to the surrounding community. Now, to be fair, Angela Ronaldo from Supreme Living, who plans to run the Tenino Thurston County House, is the only one that I've caught buying an escape house in Mexico, but we have only just begun to unravel this backstory. 
Another common theme, in addition to deceiving the neighbors and sellers of the original homes, these groups are all attempting to conceal their plans and operations from local government officials, including the sheriff, county commissioners, etc. Uh, they'll wait until the very last second or until they're confronted by nearby neighbors who start to do some homework on these places when something doesn't seem right, as of course we saw in Thurston County. So one huge benefit, which we referenced in our original video on this subject from the state standpoint, is that they can outsource these nasty guaranteed to fail projects to private contractors so that the state shifts not just the liability to somebody else, but also the blame. I mean, this is why the enabling bill was written the way it was drafted. The other extra bonus is that these private uh, for-profit or so-called non-profit groups, they're not subject to the Public Records Act or the Open Public Meetings Act. So they can conceal a whole bunch of their wrongdoing from the public. They're also harder to audit, and there's essentially zero oversight of what happens at these places. Now, don't get me wrong, if a violent sex offender decides to escape, or using the Orwellian language that these groups use now, if the violent sex offender decides to elope, these organizations and their undertrained, uneducated, and underpaid staff are not expected to actually stop them. However, and I'm sure this is going to bring comfort to the neighbors and the future victims, they are required to call and report the elopement at some point. As long as they can get in touch with the Department of Corrections before 5 p.m. during weekday hours, not on the weekends, it is possible the word might get out to the local sheriff in a few days so they can arrest the predators on, who are on the loose. I mean, who knows? We're expected to hope for the best and then keep our fingers crossed. Maybe the kids can actually get away from them this time. Now, the weird line that was demonstrated by Angela Ronaldo and kind of this cold-hearted total lack of concern for future victims of a for-profit, violent, sexual predator release program uh, may just be part of the required job description for DSHS and the state as they kind of dig up private contractors willing to do the dirty and well-compensated job of unleashing these violent criminals and the rest of us. Angela in that January 11th community meeting was obviously angry, and I've linked to it down below, but that she even had to discuss her for-profit project with the community. But she claimed that she had nine grandkids who she said would be perfectly safe if left with these violent sexual predators. Now, it doesn't appear at this time that she actually has nine grandkids, since she only has one daughter who claims to have no kids herself, but who knows? I mean, while well, she does post photos of the drag queen events that she attends, there's no references to any grandkids in her formerly very public social media feeds. Now, I'm not judging uh, to each their own, uh, but does this lady say anything truthful? I mean, nothing adds up other than the big cash piles that she expects to collect. And I'll tell you about the other items that we're still looking for and have yet to confirm. And I will also give you kind of a quick update on the Thurston County House itself. Now, we're still waiting to see the contracts with these private for-profit and non-profit groups who are planning to run these poorly thought out facilities. Uh, the inside whistleblowers at DSHS, they tell me, and of course the statements made by some of the private contractors to people who've tried to apply for jobs there, they appear to just be ludicrous sums of cash for this scheme. But I don't actually have the official contracts in hand yet. We requested them, I just don't have them. And I also have not been able to verify if these groups are essentially set up just like the nonprofits throughout the state that become the equivalent of the bank for the drug addicts and the mental patients or others they supervise, where they collect the state federal uh, program payments on their behalf and then kind of keep a cut for themselves. I'm assuming that they'll do the same thing here, but I'm actually not certain on those amounts yet either. Now, additionally, it is widely known that there's some type of insider special land deal being negotiated behind the scenes for the 4,400 acre McNeil Island, and that this inside grift graft is partially driving the desire to end the facility on that island. Now, there are very few big empty islands like this left in the Puget Sound area. So this could be a massive land deal for developers, land trusts, nonprofits, greeny groups, etc. I mean, the organizations and individuals who plan to profit from using McNeil Island afterwards could very well be part of the incentive for this horrible policy in the first place. And I want to do a separate video about McNeil Island and the options it presents to our community, but that's going to be for a future date. So back to the Tonino House. Along with another 160 or more people, I attended the community meeting last Sunday at the Tonino High School gym that was put on by the local people who were obviously angry about this fiasco next door. Uh, the new Thurston County Sheriff Sanders was there and he spoke and he answered questions and uh, he did a very good job. Uh, Republican Representative Jim Walsh from the 19th Legislative District was there and he also answered questions. 
And essentially, local community members are attempting to stop the facility from moving forward with a court injunction right now or getting the county involved in some other way. There's many problems with that facility that they've already uncovered, and this is a possible short-term, very positive result. Uh, the three-person uh, Thurston County commissioners have at least two commissioners who are clearly opposed to this facility. And they're also looking for some reasons to stop the fiasco from unfolding nearby. Uh, Democrat Commissioner Mejia and Independent Commissioner Gary Edwards, who's the former sheriff in Thurston County, they're clearly opposed. Democrat Commissioner Ty Menser appears weak and waffling on the issue. Now, there were a lot of concerns that were raised about not having people go full vigilante and burn the place down or shoot the violent sexual offenders if they're moved in here and they start to roam the neighborhood. I mean, the sheriff would understandably prefer to arrest them and nobody wants a local citizen to get in trouble for arson. Obviously, if somebody did burn the place down, unless they claim to be Antifa and they could get people to call it a peaceful arson protest or something, uh, the state would probably throw the proverbial book at them and then they would go to prison. So the AG and the local prosecutor, they might be happy to unleash violent felons in your community, but if you burn down the violent uh, sexual offender house, you are going to be prosecuted pretty aggressively, so please don't do that. Now, we still need all the insiders and whistleblowers that we can get to give us more details as we try to put together the pieces uh, for the concealed parts of this policy fiasco so far. A lot of apathetic people have woken up locally, and they didn't all go to Evergreen State College. I mean, people are certainly looking at their political leadership and the bureaucracy uh, quite a bit differently right now, as they realize there's nobody in charge who cares even a micro bit about putting their families and children at risk. People are starting out with the more time-sensitive effort of contacting the state legislature and the county commission and the governor's office about this short-term problem, but most realize that this is just the beginning. So this update should serve, as many other stories that we continue to tell should also serve, as kind of a further wake-up call to everyone that we get the worst government possible the more we attempt to ignore them or just assume that they're going to do the right thing. Apathy is the enemy of freedom and sanity when it comes to government. There are many good people who do work in government, but those are not the people in charge. The good people are not running our state agencies, and we clearly have too few of them elected to office. There are some, but clearly not enough. And frankly, there is just too much money being squandered on projects like this, one which only exists to hurt most of us, well, a select few profit. Now, unfortunately, this isn't the only insane story out there today. There are plenty more like it. You just have to look. You won't like what you find in, in most cases, but that is the reason why we must look in the first place. Uh, that is the reason that we have to pay attention. Dig deep. Don't trust. Go verify for yourself. That's the reason we must show up. Because in the end, the future will belong to those who show up. <laughs>